Here in Nevada, we do things a little differently. We build attractions for the whole world to enjoy and gathering places for our local communities to thrive. We tell the stories of our rich history while paving the way for a bright future. From natural wonders to man-made thrills. Adventuring here is anything but ordinary. Join us this season for new episodes of Spirit of Nevada. Welcome to Virginia City. Today, we take a step back in time to find out why it's called the richest place on Earth. It all dates back to 1859, when a man named Henry Comstock discovered the most valuable deposit of silver ore ever recorded, which became known as the Comstock Load. With more than 100 mines in the Comstock area, seven million tons of silver ore were produced equating to more than $600 million in both silver and gold in today's money. Nearly all the passages have been closed for over a century, but here at the Collar Mine, you can stop on by and take a guided tour. Just ask for Jay. How did you get into this business? I was a collector of mining, and I started collecting mines. And so it's just part of collecting. This is an antique. Mines are an antique. This is the earliest part of Virginia City, 1859. This is the only mine left in town to see the Comstock load in. We're headed through the attic now, the portal, and we're headed down into the drift itself. The Collar Mine was one of the leading producers on the Comstock. Over the course of its 80 years in operation, Miners blasted and carted out some $17 million in silver and gold. Many traveled from all across the country to seek their fortune deep in this mine, but it was backbreaking work. I can't imagine eight hours a day being in there, but the miners, they had dedication. Outside the mine shaft, you'll find tons of historical artifacts on display that tell the stories of what it was like to work in the Collar Mine. As you're coming in from Reno, from the north up here, you're coming up Garga Grade on that long climb. You come in first, you see Virginia City in the distance, you cross the Sierra. This whole 10 year of climbing the hill, they thought it was a gold strike, but when they got up the top, it was a silver strike, the largest wow. in history of America here. Here you are at the Grass Valley level of the Collar Mine. William Collar started in 1861. He laid out the claim in 1859, and we start our journey inward 400 feet into the fall to the Comstock load. The miners were the richest people in town. They had so much money to spend, that's why the town formed for the miners. This was a mining empire, Virginia City was. No, it really was. And to see the fact that you guys have everything still here and some of that miner life, mm -hmm. and you have right next to me some things that the miners would typically wear. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, if they, well once they got the carbide, this would be their carbide container with water. They would have a belt on, and behind me here, are the carbide lamps. They came along in about 1910, 1915. But first the miners worked with the candlesticks, okay? These are candlesticks, miner candlesticks with the wax candles in them right here. It's crazy to think about miner life and using candles. Mm -hmm. You know, you can only do so much until your candle's out, then you better get back out. If you were a miner, you had three candles a day. There's a piece right behind me. Can you tell me a little bit about it? That's a stamp mill. It's for crushing rock. It was invented in Europe hundreds of years ago. Here we have a hit and miss engine hoist. Probably 19 teens, 20s right here. Behind me over here is a two piston pneumatic or steam hoist. I love these things right here. They're archaic and very early. And okay. how many people would typically work on this machine? You'd have a hoist operator and a brake operator. The same person would run the forward and reverse. This would be the drum brake here to slow it down. And this would be your spool with maybe 
400 to 1,000 feet of cable on it, okay? Wow, so it goes real deep. This here is an Ellis ball mill, probably 1920s. It didn't have any gears or cranks, but look how easy it is. You can turn it by hand. You have the pulverized gold going inside here. It's crushing even further below. You're adding weight in this barrel right here to get onto it. You're adding water, and it's bringing the gold out at the end. This is called an Ellis Gold Mill. Can I try? Sure. I've never seen one of these in real life before. You don't see them. I think it's so unique. I love the fact that you're so passionate about it and teach others that are visiting from all over the world to come here. Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate you for coming. In the 1860s and 70s, new American millionaires were popping up all over thanks to the discovery of silver. And the V&T Railroad was here for it all. Last time I was at a train station, I was an engineer driving the train. But this time around, I get to be a passenger on one of the most famous short lines in the country, the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. Well, the reason this railroad was built, the Bank of California came up here and they were so monopolizing, they repossessed a lot of mines. Now they had to have a way to get all of their ore down to the Carson River Canyon because that's where they also own the only hydraulic stamp mills. So it was bank driven early on, um, very, very successful for them. Within three months of the completion of the railroad, they were already enjoying a monthly profit of $400,000. Wow, and at that time, it's, that's a lot of money. When you take a ride on the VNT, time stands still, and you get to see a glimpse into life on the railroad. For 80 years, the V&T carried freight to and from the mines. Now they have become a popular attraction for visitors in Virginia City. We're gonna point out an awful lot of the famous mines. We're gonna talk about why the railroad was actually built. About a thousand yards to the east over there, you see a great big pile of yellowish dirt. That's a very dead giveaway that it's a very deep mine. By 1873, it was the deepest mine in the entire world. I throw in a couple of really bad jokes just to make sure everybody's still listening. Now this beautiful little railroad was first constructed way back in 1869. So that means this year we are exactly 154 years old. No, this is not the original crew. Almost half those people are dead. <laughs> if you don't laugh at the bad jokes, I'm not gonna waste any of the good ones on you. So make it easy on yourself. What is your favorite part of being a conductor here? The people. Yeah, I'm sure you meet so many different people yeah. from all over. It's seven here. trains a day. Seven days we have, we're real busy, which is, I think, the most fun. Seven trains a day? Seven a day. You guys stay busy here. Yeah, we do. A lot goes into maintaining these old trains in running condition, and it takes a whole team to keep them chugging along the tracks. The best part about my job is running the locomotive up the hill and just listening to her work. I've always dreamed about being an engineer on the railroad, and it's a lot of fun. Tell me a little bit about all the equipment that you use. This here is our throttle. This makes the engine go down the tracks, uh, provides steam for the cylinders. This lever here is called the power reverse, controls forward and reverse. A steam locomotive will go equally forwards as it does reverse, so it'll do the same speed and power forward and reverse. This lever here is our train brakes for setting up the brakes on the train. This one here is our independent brakes. This only sets the brakes on the engine. Uh, over here, Ed has an oil valve, controls the flow of the oil into the firebox uh, to make a bigger fire as we're using the steam coming down the track. Uh, here's an atomizer valve. This controls the spray of the oil in the firebox. And here's a blower. When you're sitting, you kind of need an artificial draft. It'll draft the fire through the, the boiler tubes and create more steam. Well, I actually am the hostess on what we call the long line, which is the train that comes up from Carson City to Virginia City on weekends. How fun. Yeah, it really is fun. It's one of my favorite things to do. So you get to greet everyone. Right. You get to make new friends every day. I do. I get to play dress up. I have so much fun. Very nice. And I heard that you are Neil's wife. 
Yes, that is a very true statement. So yes, question for you. We mm -hmm. just got off the short line, had a blast, so much fun. All of his jokes, does he test them out on you first? Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what is your favorite thing about Virginia City? Well, of course, everybody says this, but it's true. I love the history. I have been coming to Virginia City since I was like 14 years old. We used to come out here on vacations. My mother was an artist and she loved painting all the old buildings. So wow. every time I come back, I think of my mom and all the things she loved. And so, yeah, it's just a real special place to me. It's not just about where you go, but who goes with you that counts. Bring someone you love and take a ride through Virginia City's beautiful past. Many of Virginia City's wealthy elite built beautiful homes in the 1800s with their mining riches. But one stunning and allegedly haunted Victorian era mansion stands out above the rest. Welcome to the Mackey Mansion. The Mackey Mansion is actually the longest standing uh, structure in Virginia City. It was built in 1859 by George Hurst. A lot of people think it was Mr. Mackey, but it was not. It was George Hurst himself. And so we are celebrating this year 164 years of it being existing. Congratulations. Existing. And it survived fires and everything. So it's pretty Correct. impressive that you have all that still standing here. Yes, indeed. And what is so special about this particular room that we're in right now? Um, this particular room is actually the original office of the Golden Curry Mine. Uh, George Hurst actually ran that business here and eventually uh, John Mackey did. Um, so they operated like three mines out of this office. So a lot of business took place. A lot of potential investors came through. So all the miners too had to come and report. Correct, as well. yes, that's correct. Right behind us, we have this roll top desk right here. This actually belonged to Mr. Mackey himself. This is where he would actually work and conduct his business. How special. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's a very special piece that we have here. We have an actual human skull. In a real human skull. A real human skull. Um, it is in the display case because it was discovered in 1880s on the property here of the Mackey Mansion. Old. Very old. Um, we believe it to be a female skull. Uh, we actually have named her Veronica, believe it or not. We kind of do that here at the mansion, but she is a special piece in that display case. I actually call her the greeter of the office and keeper of this, the display case. One second while I yeah. reset. Our crew just had a paranormal encounter. Uh, well, his equipment uh, just died. And yes. that tends to happen when paranormal energy comes in contact with your electronics. Where he's standing, it is kind of significant that he would say that that happened because on our tours, we highlight that space because right there in front of that door, um, there were two men that actually were shot dead in that space in 1883 when they tried to rob the vault. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, what is that? If you're not That's a believer, real. we just made you a believer That's just real. now. Right in right that here spot. In the middle right there the in front of that door. Wow, this room is beautiful. Where are we at now? Um, this is actually the Mackey Mansion parlor. Um, this room was a very important room back then. Back in the 1800s, they didn't have mortuaries like we do today. So the specific reason for a parlor was actually used for displaying your dead and doing those kinds of things, which this yeah. room was probably used for at one time or another. But it was also used for gatherings, card playing, those kinds of things. So it was a multi-purpose room. During my research, I've noticed that there is some paranormal activity that has happened here at the mansion. Correct. And that there's a specific maid that kind of roams this area named Harriet. Can you tell me a little bit about her? Uh, yes, Harriet does roam um, the Mackey Mansion. She is one of our resident spirits. She was a longtime uh, maid of the Mackeys and worked at the Mackey Mansion. Um, we're not really sure if she actually had perished here or not, but she likes to linger, likes to hang out. Um, on our tours, she's been seen in this particular room, as well as the office, as well as upstairs and on the staircases. So she does like to come around. Um, as tour guides, we actually have the opportunity to kind of maintain the Mackey Mansion by dusting, those kinds of things. That's when she tends to show herself if we're not doing a very good job. I think she's making it known that we need to kind of step up our game and Keep do better nice clean. at dusting and cleaning. Mm -hmm. So we kind of take that as hint. Well, she even does her job in the afterlife. Absolutely, she, still, she sure does. <laughs> yep, absolutely. After seeing no signs of Harriet, we decided to make our way upstairs to hear more ghost stories. We've also had a couple of children's spirits on the staircase as well. 
They tend to appear and tend to run up and down the steps. We have Lily and we have Emma. So two girls. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. And they love going up and down those stairs. Okay, and this is what we refer to as our creepy doll room. Um, on our tours, we actually do tell people about this room and it some of the dolls creepy that in here. we've acquired in here. Uh, they do tend to have uh, uh, some personalities. Do they move around? When you some of them do. Some of them do. We've actually had people on tours actually see some of them move. This particular doll right there in the chair that you see, that is Anne. Um, and there's times where the chair has been completely turned around. You can come over here and see it right now facing us, but you can come back later and it will be completely turned around facing the other direction. Why, we have no idea. Okay, well, let's move on to the next room. All right, let's go. Right now we're entering uh, Mr. Mackey's master suite. Um, back then they actually had um, uh, separate bedrooms, but conjoining doors. And right now we're entering into Mrs. Mackey's master suite. Wow, this is beautiful. And this is, um, yeah, this is her space. And this is where she would have uh, resided and spent her time when she was here. We've tried to make it as authentic as possible for people who come on the tours so they get an idea of what it was like back in that time period. But if you're really wanting to look at something that's original to the Mackey Mansion, there is one more thing I have to show you. I would love to. All right, well, let's go. Okay. Wait, you took me all the way over here for a toilet? This Correct. Is, this is the big deal? Yes. Okay, so why? To speak about original, that is original to the Mackey Mansion. When George Hurst built this house, he uh, included the first indoor plumbing bathroom on the West Coast. On the West Coast, that mm -hmm. is huge. And it includes this toilet, which is very special. We highlight this on our tours because the design on the toilet itself, as well as the inside, is actually real gold leaf paint. So it's super valuable. And we always, like I said, highlight it on the tours and tell people, hey, you're gonna look at the Mackey throne. And that's pretty much what that is. <laughs> and the throne is the toilet, because it's worth so much money. Correct. So I understand we're not the only television show to come here. Ghost Adventures has been here, and who else? Um, one of the other shows that have been here is actually Dead Files with the Travel Channel. So those two shows have actually come here and filmed and have done investigations here as well. And both Ghost Adventures and Dead Files have kind of put us on the map. That's how people kind of find us. Welcome to Virginia City, where the Wild West lives again. Hey, hey guys, I'm, I'm trying to film a program right here. Can you please keep it down? <laughs> and where the good guys always win. Don't worry, he's alive. That's Lee McKechnie, creator of the Virginia City Outlaws, a Wild West comedy stunt show. Here, let me help you up. Are you all right? Yeah, you did pretty good. Not too bad. Ooh. It's hard totally believable. <laughs> I get too old for this. Lee and his cast of cowboys have been entertaining crowds at this Virginia City hey. Theater for over 20 years. Howdy, folks! How y'all doing today? Yeah. We're gonna draw a line in the sand right here, and if you guys cross that line, I'm gonna shoot you for your safety. <laughs> What are you doing? You can't shoot the tourist. Why not? It's tourist season. It is tourist season. Uh, how about this? You just shoot one, but make it look like an accident. Okay, you're an accident! It's okay, my dad called me that too. <laughs> They get a lot of visitors from around the world. Yes. They all speak English and such. So we had to put together uh, what we call the international language, uh, which is stunts, comedy, pratfalls, that kind of stuff. I made it! <laughs> we got a lot of kids, we got a lot of older folks. We got folks that remember the old westerns like the John Wayne movies or the old TV series like Gunsmoke and such. And our favorite series, of course, right here from Virginia City, Bonanza. Uh, that was shot mostly at the Ponderosa Ranch about half an hour from here. Please. Okay, let's see. Impressive. Okay, here we go. Two Our theme is the good guy always wins, uh, no matter what. He gets a round of applause, he gets the claps and the whistles. A lot of laughter, a lot of audience participation. Yeah, I know you guys got brought on stage, and the crew didn't even tell me. No idea. Surprises. So many surprises. Right, you did great too, thank by the you, way, in that you. fast draw competition. Thank you. Oops. Sam! 
Uh-oh. Is this how they do it in Vegas? Oh, my bad. They, they would do it in Vegas. Oh, my so what is your favorite part about Virginia City? I just like pulling into it. It sets you back like in time. Like stepping back, yeah, exactly. Step back in time. That's yeah. exactly what I was exactly. going to say. It yep. really is. And also the tourists that come here, uh, come here with a smile on their face. They're here for a good time. And the Virginia City Outlaws certainly deliver. So you're walking the streets of Virginia City and you're craving a nice cold beer. Well, the Bucket of Blood Saloon is the place to go. The saloon is a little over 100 years old and it's been in my family for the last 92 years. It's always been kind of like the center of focus in Virginia City, and we welcome people from all over the world every day of the year. You're walking into a living museum. Uh, when my grandfather bought this saloon in 1931, it was pretty bare back then, but he and his wife were antique dealers, and so they bought and sold antiques and then ended up decorating the whole saloon uh, with those antiques. And then and my father and mother continue that tradition also. We highlight Western music here, since we are part of the Old West, and we have some of the top entertainment that perform right here. We have David John and the Comstock Cowboys. They've been performing here for 21 years. Uh, they're uh, known all over, they've got a big following, and all of their fans show up wearing Western wear just like the band does. There's been a lot of history here, and people seem to be interested in that all over the world. We get them from all over the world here to see what the Bonanza really was. We try to keep it going. So I was listening to you on the piano, and you have quite the skills. Tell me a little bit about how long you've been playing here. A hundred years. Oh, here. <laughs> yes, yeah, oh, here. I've been playing a hundred years. She has squeak steel. She's 84 years old. She's in the Guinness Book of World Records for playing the most songs in a 24 hour period. And that was 1800 songs. So she's been playing here around 20 years herself. And I'm classically trained, I went to Oberlin, but I could always play by ear. And if I didn't play by ear, I couldn't do this job because people come up and they say, do you know blank? And I'm like, can you sing a few bars? And then I can play it. So you just play it right there on the spot. No right practice, spot. you just you just know. It just yeah. comes to you naturally. Yeah. Right. I always say I play 300 years of music. I play classical and some country. I'm more like the old country, old western. Uh, a lot of old rock and roll, like Journey and, you know, and Lady Gaga Shallow. Wow. And see, I mean. Impressive. Any, you really yeah. can play anything. anything that I love. Yeah. I can play. Now that we explore Virginia City's historic side, it's time to see the town's quirky side. We're here for a day at the races, and if you think we're racing horses, think again. People come from all over the place to watch the 64th annual camel races here in Virginia City. It's race day! As you can see behind us, a big open track, getting nicely fluffed up, and just behind us, some wonderful animals that they can race. One, camels, two, ostriches, and we have a few zebras that are also kind of uh, available for racing. So it's not your typical race day here. No, not at all, not at all. It started out as a joke between newspapers and publications. Can you tell me the backstory on that? Yeah, well, let's go a little bit further back. So 1860 to 1863, a rather famous guy was here, Samuel Clemens, later to be known as Mark Twain. He worked for a newspaper called the Territorial Enterprise. And there he had a tendency to uh, embellish or exaggerate or sometimes <laughs> just make a bunch of stuff up, fun, often of referred to as hoaxes. And so a little story was written about camels racing up and down C Street. And sounds the story, yeah, <laughs> sounds great. And the, uh, they published it, and San Francisco Chronicle caught the story, and they said, oh, this is fascinating. Let's also publish it. So they published it in their newspaper, and come to find out it was just a hoax. <laughs> Not wanting to be uh, you know, made fun of for posting up something that wasn't true, they actually went down to the San Francisco Zoo, picked up a couple of camels, brought them up here to C Street, and ran them down um, in racing. How cool is that? And now the tradition continues on. Keep coming and coming and coming. 
this has grown from that little race on C Street to what you see behind us now. We have four shows uh, on three different days and people, like I said, sell out. People come from all over just to experience this. Talking about riding though, I, I think we might have an opportunity are you game? I'm game. I'm you know, always game. Uh, we'll get you back there with the jockeys. We'll give you a little bit of a training, and then it's all up to you whether you hang on or not. Not on me. Oh, it's on me. Oh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna go out there and have a great time. <clears throat> How does one become a, a, a jockey for camels? Well, they gotta have a loose screw. <clears throat> Are there any tips? Because I like to win. Keep your feet out in front of you. Okay. Don't if, don't lean forward. You lean forward, the hump will start bouncing you. When you start bouncing, you come off. Okay, so just so lean you, back. You, you don't want that hump to start bouncing you. And the biggest thing is, is give the camel his head with the lead rope. Don't pull him back. He knows okay. where he's going and just hang on. Just ho hold on for the ride. Enjoy just the good time. hold on for the ride, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your tips, your knowledge. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to getting on one of the camels. Well, I'm looking forward to catching you. Catching me? Oh, I hope <laughs> not. I hope not. Just hold on tight. New jockeys like yourself that have yes. never been on a camel, we want to do a little bit of training. Um, so you're not just, you know, going no on idea what's going on. Yes. So we're going to put you on a gentle camel here. They're going to walk around. And I'm going to show you how to sit on the camel and kind of give you just a taste of taste of what to expect. <laughs> it's going to be a lot more action packed when you're on a racing camel. But at least this way you kind of know how to sit down and, and kind of get the feel of their gait because they do have a very different, unusual gait. Okay. All so, right. So come on. That's Linda. Let's go on up and let's get a camel ride. All right. I'm ready. Oh, the kids can just come up and. Oh, yeah. Ride the camels before we start the race. Yeah, not just kids, everybody. Everyone. Yeah. Hi. Now, what you're going to do, it's going to be a little more action packed when you get on them. Okay. But uh, the principle's the same. You're going to sit on it just like you'd sit on a horse, put your leg across. Okay. All right, just like that. Try to sit up as straight as you can like and this? keep your feet in front of you. Feet in front okay. of you like this. Yep. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, First bugle time. boy. First time. On the post. Go. There she goes. <laughs> Wow, I'm pretty high up here. I, I guess I don't, yeah, I'm tall today. Normally I'm small, but today I get to be on top of the world, on top of this camel to be exact. <laughs> what do you think? Woo! Imagine Jesus. doing that about 100 times faster and up and down more. Oh my gosh, I mean, how many times am I going around? You're just gonna go around once. You're gonna come out of the starting gates. There's gonna be a finish line across there in just a little bit. We just got done working the track. And hopefully I'll see you after the finish line and not before. I know, hopefully it's after. I'm gonna hold on real tight. All right, sit up straight, keep your feet in front of you. Okay. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay. All well, right, good it. luck. Thank you. Okay, training's done. They're getting the camels ready for race time. So I'm not gonna lie, I was feeling really nervous as I mounted my camel. It's gonna be okay. But as soon as the starting gates opened and we took off, the adrenaline kicked in and I was having a blast. came in second place by just a nose. But honestly, I was just proud to have made it all the way to the finish line without falling off. This is my first time racing a camel. So I survived my camel race. I was really nervous ahead of time, but I am so glad I did it. Definitely mark it off my bucket list. Earn this margarita right here. I also get to see everyone else ride zebras and ostriches. It's pretty wild out here. I'm gonna take a look around, enjoy the rest of the day. Whether you're looking for the thrill of a wild ride or just a fun day enjoying a unique experience, the Virginia City Camel Races are a must do for your Nevada bucket list. Until next time, I'm Samantha Cheon. <laughs>